Praise the Lord. Welcome those who may be listening later on through YouTube or Facebook or whatever we find to put this thing on. I welcome you into our Thursday evening Bible study. We're going through the book of Romans. We're looking at the book of Romans, as we've said here the last few times, actually since we started the book of Romans. And as the Lord has laid it on our hearts, you know, looking at the book of Romans to take the gospel message to the world around us. And we've, we've talked about that world around us. It's not, it's not uh, that we go and we, we go to Mexico or go to Canada or wherever or Africa or something like that because most of us will never go to those places. But the world around us is those people that are in our lives on a daily basis, whether it's our, our children, our grandchildren, our cousins, or aunts and uncles, parents, co-workers, whoever it is. <clears throat> We've been looking here in the book of Romans and, and seeing, you know, really we're seeing where we were as, as unsaved. We're seeing how they are who are unsaved. We're seeing how as well, especially here in, in Romans chapter 7, we're seeing how the church today is. Do you know the church today needs the gospel? Oh, yeah. The church today, those that are in the church, I'm talking about those who are saved, those who have given their heart, given their life to Christ, but they may not be, for whatever reason, be being taught what they need to be taught to realize and to know, as Paul will say over and over, here in, in, in these, these few chapters of, of Romans, you know, he's talking about, don't you know? Don't you realize? Don't you understand what it is that you have been, that, that your salvation, that what Christ did at Calvary has done for you? Don't you know what the inheritance that you have is? As I was, as I was studying for uh, uh, last Sunday and what we preached a little bit the Sunday before there and in and Ezekiel, what we'll pick up here in another week or so after Greg ministers this Sunday. But uh, one of the things that, that really leaped out at me is as I was studying that is inheritance. And I, I, I ministered a little bit of that last Sunday there in Palestine. But a lot of times we think of inheritance, or at least I have always thought of it as, uh, or thought of inheritance in this manner. An inheritance is what you receive after somebody else has died. Is that pretty much the understanding that we all have, at least maybe in this nation, of what an, un an inheritance is? You don't get it until that person dies. And that being the, the case, as we look into the Word of God and, and we see that we have an inheritance in Christ the way we look at things, I guess, in the Western world, however you want to call it, in America, or maybe just us, I don't you know, like I was saying Sunday, but we look at inheritance as somebody has to pass away for us to receive it, and whenever you kind of bring that down to the Word of God and, and, and the things that we have in Christ, you come, you come up with a dilemma, some, you know, if you really think about it. Because if we're going to receive an inheritance from him that means he has to die God has to go away have you ever thought about that probably not I just maybe it's just me that thinks about these things sometimes but that is not the case in our relationship with God that was not the case in the time in which Paul wrote the letters of the New Testament in that world of that day, the in the Roman world of that day, as I was studying about inheritance and about what we receive, what we have, present tense, in Christ Jesus, we don't have to wait because God's not going to die. And in Roman culture of that day, something that I think is lost to the world today, whenever somebody inherited something I guess you would say inheritance was looked at a whole lot different then because in that day you didn't receive inheritance when they died you received an inheritance you received what your daddy had your grandpa had whatever it might be you received that that was yours on the day of your birth 
Do you realize that? What we receive in Christ, it is ours on the day. I'm not talking about physical birth. That's what the Romans were doing. When that kid was born physically, the inheritance was already his. When we, in the body of Christ, when we're born spiritually, you see, we're born into this world spiritually dead. But when we are born again, Jesus said you must be born again. When we are born again, we receive that inheritance of God on that day right then. Everything that he has is ours. Mm, ain't that good? Amen. Understanding that. That, that floods a whole new light on our walk with the Lord. I don't have to wait for the sweet by and by. I don't have to wait and measure up in my walk with the Lord. I don't have to. You are set free the day you're born again. That's part of our inheritance. We see, we're going to see a little bit of that. We receive that. When we say, Lord, forgive me. I make you my Lord and Savior. I come to you and I bow myself to you, Lord. Do you realize, you know, we, we've often talked about that, that, excuse me, God, he, as he told Abraham, he said, I am your exceeding great reward. Abraham, or God might as well have said to Abraham, I am am your inheritance what you need is in me and it is your not waiting for you to die you see we don't have to wait till we die physically in this body and we go on to eternity we don't have to wait for eternity to receive the inheritance <laughs> that we have in Christ mm, that that should be a, a, a cause for rejoicing and as well as it, it, it should bring us to the realization that if there are things in our life that are dragging us down, that are holding us back, being that the inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, that we are already past tense right now, if you will, present tense as well, whatever you need deliverance from, you have been delivered. Now walk in it. Amen. If you inherit something and you don't know what you got, how are you going to walk with it? How are you going to take possession of it? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. You don't have to spend hours and hours and hours begging God, tearing like they used to say in the altar. You, if, you're, if we're having to spend time tearing in the altar for the Holy Spirit, that's because we don't understand that he's already been given. We don't understand that he is a portion of that inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, and he's already ours. We in faith, just as we by faith have accepted Christ, in faith, we receive. That word receive is a wonderful word. It means to take and make it our own. Receive it. It's given to you. Just pick it up, if you will, using those, those terms. Pick it up and put it in your pocket if you want to. Just something that we can bring it down. We're not going to put the Holy Spirit in our pocket, but you know what I'm talking about. He's ours. He's yours already. Because of what Jesus did at Calvary. All Jesus, all, the, all God is asking for, all our Father is asking of us, just believe me. Take me at my word. Trust me that what I have said is yours, is yours. You see, we don't have, we have not because we ask not, we ask not because we ask amiss. We don't ask because we don't know a lot of times. Now you know. Don't you know that you know? So anyway, that was just a, a little brief deal there about inheritance that I think is important for us to get and not forget. You know, to understand and not, 
not forget what we have in Christ. So Romans 7, picking up in verse 4. I got a little horse allergies or something over the weekend with the cold air in the room and then cold air otherwise and other stuff, but just bear with me this evening. So Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, just picking up a little bit from what we've looked at there, Paul is using the analogy or an example. He, he, he is showing us in that, the, you know, in verse 6 we saw that we have been set free from the power of the sin nature. We have, have died to it. He, he showed us in chapter 6, he's, he's revealed to you in case you didn't know, he has revealed to us that what Jesus did at Calvary, he did for us and he did in our place. And when we put our faith in that, we are then united with him. We are then, we become one with him in what he did. So it, it, it is, it, he did it on behalf of us on our part. It says that we have been crucified, you know, that with Christ, his death was our death. It says that his burial was our burial. And it says that his resurrection was our resurrection. That's where we understand that we have already been resurrected to newness of life in Christ. We've been born again. And that newness of life, we need to understand, is, is all the old, the worn out, that which we were before, is to be pushed aside. No longer is that to be in our lives. Shall we continue to live a life of sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's old. That's done away with. It's pushed aside. Now that you've been born again, now that you're a new creation in Christ, walk in that new life that you have. Walk in that new power source of the Holy Spirit, of that divine nature that has been given to you in Christ walk, live, that's what that walk means, carry out your daily life in that manner, you know, don't carry out your daily life in the old manner, the old manner still, the old manner brought death, the new manner, the new energy that we have for life, the new life in Christ brings more life, and life more abundant, as he said in John 10, so, we saw there in Romans chapter, in chapter 6 that we've been set free from the power and the dominion of the sin nature. That nature we inherited from Adam whenever he fell. In Christ, as we put our faith in what he has done, we are then set free from that. We, are, we use the analogy of being unplugged from one thing and plugged in. The power source has changed. No longer are we driven no longer are we as our source of power the old nature our source of strength the old nature our, 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 our drive from the old nature our power source our strength our drive now comes from the new nature you know brother Greg was talking to me this evening about a new saw he's going to get and right now that saw runs on an electric motor but he can't get the electricity there, so he's got to change it to a gas motor. The old way was the electric motor. The new way is the gas motor. You see what I mean? We have changed power sources. No longer are we driven by this one. We're driven by that one. Our power don't come from over here. Our power comes from over here, a new source in Christ Jesus. He's our new power source. And his power is divine. His power never wears out. His power is clean power. Just to use a down-to-earth analogy. Ain't no brownouts with the Holy Spirit. Do right. what? I said super nuclear power. Yeah, super clean. <laughs> yeah. We're powered by natural gas. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Anyhow. So, he goes on in, in chapter 7 after like I said, after dealing with the sin nature, after dealing with our being set free from it, he now goes on to, to, to reveal to us that we have been as well, as well as being set free from the power of the sin nature, we are set free from, from 
the law or living by means of law to please God or to be in relationship with God. And he uses the example here, as we, as we saw here last week, of, of a woman that's married to one man, yet she's, if you will, living with another. She has committed in marriage to one, but now she stepped outside of that, that covenant relationship. She stepped outside of that one, and now she has entered into a relationship with another, and the Word of God says she is an adulterer because of that. We all understand that in the natural. But in the spiritual, it works the same way. You see, we have been in covenant relationship at one time, we were in relationship with the law. The law had dominion over us just as the sin nature had dominion over us. But whenever, as Paul used here, the husband died. Well, the husband, the law didn't die. Understand that. But we, who died? We died. How did we die? Romans chapter 6. We died in Christ. When Christ died, he died for us. And by faith, we are dead. And so as we understand in the physical, whether, you know, as a, as a couple is married, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, there ain't marriage between none other. Understand that. As God sees it, we see things like God sees things. We call things like God sees things. Like he calls it. Two men can't get married. That's not a right covenant relationship. That is an abomination relationship. Same way with two women or... God forbid a person and a dog and whatever else they try to anyway we enter into a covenant relationship man and woman when we get married as long as they both live that covenant is still binding is what Paul is showing us here if one or the other steps outside of that covenant just like he showed here they become a, a, an adulterer well we we were in relationship. We were, if you will, in covenant with the law before. The law was a covenant. We were in that before. We were born fleshly into that. But because of what Christ did, when we put our faith in him, the law does not die. The word of God says that Christ was the end of the law for righteousness to them that will believe. That tells us that those who do not put their trust in Christ, they are still under the dominion of the law because they are still under the power and the dominion of the sin nature. You see, the two go hand in hand, and that's kind of where we're going this evening. The law and the sin nature go hand in hand. The law is not bad. The law is not evil. Paul would say that as well. That it, it is not bad, it is not evil, but it is good. The law, if you will, I think Kenneth Weist and, and his explanation of some of this points out that the, the law is like the sun, the sun shining on a field. And on that field, the, the sun does not, does not produce the, the, the weeds that are in the field. The sun only makes possible that the weeds can be revealed. When the sun shines on it, the weeds sprout up. You see, that's, that's the relationship that the law has. The law doesn't produce sin, really. But the law reveals the sin that's already in our hearts. When we are, 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 are unsaved and, and, and controlled and under the power and the dominion of the sin nature, the purpose of the law was to show us what sin was. That's what Romans 5 tells us. That it showed us how exceedingly sinful we already were. That sin was already in us. That weeds was already in the field of our heart. The law only showed it for what it was. Understand that about the law. So the law and the sin nature go hand in hand. But when we put our faith in Christ, just as Romans 6 shows us that, that we are set free from the power of the sin nature, having then been set free from that power and dominion, we are as well, the heading here for, for Romans 7 in my Bible says, We've been released from the law. Set free from that law. As Paul uses the analogy with the woman and the husband. If he dies, she's free of that law. Today, in a marriage situation, if husband or wife, either one, dies, 
The other is free to marry another. Be joined. That's what marriage is. Marriage is a joining of two together, making them one. Isn't that what the word tells us? Let what, what, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The husband and the wife come together. The two shall be one. That is the same thing that takes place spiritually in your, your life, our lives. As we put our faith in Christ, we put our trust in him, we are joined to him. We are partakers with him. That's why we say his death was our death. Paul would say in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. I wasn't crucified apart from him. I wasn't actually physically crucified, but Jesus was. And his crucifixion was on behalf of me, for me. I've been, I receive the benefits from, what is the benefits of Christ having been crucified? That benefit is being set free. Somebody had to die here. We had to die in Christ to be set free from the sin nature and from the, the dominion of the law. That dominion has to do with rulership and also if, if you want to look at it this way, the law held us down like you put your thumb on something. It kept us from being what we could be until Christ came in relationship with God. You see, because it showed us our sinfulness. It showed us, what does it say? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It showed us what was in our hearts and what was in our hearts interfered kept us, hindered us from being in relationship with our heavenly father and, and really in the life of a believer today even a believer whose faith is in Christ and him crucified who, who is learning and, and understanding the message of the cross that believer, every one of us because we're in this flesh and because, not that the Holy Spirit can't do the work, but a lot of times we don't allow him, we frustrate his work in our lives. For whatever reason, we don't want to let go of something or we don't think something is this, or maybe there are things that he has that we can't yet handle that he's got to show us. But there's something in all of us that still hinders that walk that closeness that we can have with God. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in our lives is for him to reveal to us, and he will if we'll yield to him, if we'll ask him. David would say, search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. He will reveal to us if we'll search, if we'll ask him those things in our life, whether they be attitudes or thoughts or things that we're doing or whatever it might be, he will reveal to us those things that are hindering our walk. A lot of the times those things have to do with our faith. You see, the, the enemy, he wants to hinder your faith. If There again, if you don't know it, you can't put your trust in it. If you don't know what Christ has done for you, you can't trust in it and walk in it, thereby enjoying the benefits and the fruit of it. Which, which the greatest benefit in fruit is that relationship with our Heavenly Father. You see, the devil wants to keep us secret. In our nation today, we've got all kinds of craziness that's taught in, 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 in our public schools to the kids. They, they've called it, I've, I've heard some say, and I think some have written books about the dumbing down of America. The dumbing down. Well, we've had a dumbing down of the church for a lot longer of a time than we've had a dumbing down of the people in this nation. Because what goes, what starts in the church overflows to the nation. As goes the church, so goes the nation. The enemy has done his work in the church first, and then he does his work out there in the world. Because do you realize today, do you realize and understand that the enemy can't operate out there until the church has been, the influence of the church has been taken a little bit, done, you know, 
messed up somehow. Huh? Tainted. Tainted, hindered, or, or, or stopped. The church is what holds back the enemy. If he can dumb us down, if, if, if he can get us to the place where, excuse me, I don't mean to spit on nobody, but if he can get us to the place where we don't understand and know what we have in Christ, then we don't know where to stand and be out there being salt and light in this world. And if the church isn't salt and light, that gives the devil the open door to use his, his cohoots or whoever they are in this world to go and do what he wants to do out there. But he's got to start it in the church. Amen. Hmm. We need to get back in the church. And that, that, that's, that's a major point in that, that message that he's shown me there and that we'll look at more there of standing in the gap. The church has got to get back to the place, you and I. I told the folks Sunday night as I was trying to minister on the Holy Spirit, but I told them we have got to get back to that place in our communities and in our families and in our jobs. We've got to get back in that place as we sung tonight where we stand upon the Word of God, where we take a stand where we stand and we say we will not be moved. We will not lay down the standards of the word of God, but we will hold strong. Keep the faith, Paul would say. We got to have a determination. We got to stop saying in our, in our well, maybe not necessarily stop saying it, but we need to be understanding. When they say I am determined, to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we need to understand that that means in every aspect of our lives. No matter what it is. I told those folks Sunday night, I said, we need to have some believers in, the, in our churches that are getting involved in the school board and getting involved in the, the city councils and getting involved in the state and wherever else the Lord would lead them. But we, we in the church, we have bought that lie of, oh, separation of church and state. And we can't, see, that's where the enemy has come in and he's pulled the wool over our eyes and said, oh, because you're 5013C, you can't preach, you know, vote for this one or vote for that one or stand for this or stand for that because you might lose your tax. But so what? My goodness. We better be willing to suffer some loss for the kingdom in this world for the kingdom of God and be the salt and the light that we need to be. I didn't come here this evening to say all this, but it's coming out that way. Greg preaching Sunday, and I don't I'm not going to, so I'm preaching now. <laughs> anyway, going back to the law. Going back to what we've been set free from. The dominion of the law. We've been released from it. Verse 3, he says, If whilst her husband lives, she be married to another, she'll be called an adulteress. We got a lot of spiritual adultery going on in the church today. Either, I hope it's more out of ignorance than anything. It's more out of don't you know than anything. What is spiritual adultery? Anybody? Your faith in anything other than Christ and Exactly. Our faith placed in anything other than what Christ did for us at Calvary. Our faith placed in anything. And you see, that's what we need to ask the Lord. To search us and see if there's any wicked way. You see, too often, I kind of brought that up a little bit Sunday as well. Those wicked ways. We think of wicked ways as cussing and drinking whatever else, that's the fruit of the wicked ways. You see, the wicked way is anything that our faith is in, no matter how good it is. Do you know we can have our faith in good things and they're wicked? It's wicked ways because we're trusting in those things to, to, to enhance or God to smile at us. We're trusting in those things to find favor with God. How do we find favor with Him? What pleases God? Faith. Faith. 
without faith, or Hebrews tells us, it's impossible. I believe it's Hebrews, maybe it's Romans. I got a little, anyway. Impossible. Imp it, it's word. not possible at all. Right. It doesn't say it's partly possible, but it's impossible. It's not going to happen. What's that faith he's talking about? Faith in what he's provided through Christ. That sacrifice. It's always been about the sacrifice. Old Testament or New, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's always about the sacrifice. How did they overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Faith in what he did. But in our churches, even in our cross church, I have determined not to know anything. Well, if you determine not to know anything but Christ and him crucified, you better be living it. That's going to show your determination. And I'm talking about living it when nobody's watching. Mm -mm. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another. She be, that marriage there means to be joined, be a partaker with. She be joined to another. We join ourselves to other things by placing our faith in them. The greatest evil, and I'm calling it an evil because it is, in the church and even in the world today is the evil of that false religion of psychology. Yes. If you don't think psychology is a religion, you're blind. Because psychology is something that <laughs> people have put their trust in and go paid the guy a hundred bucks to lay on his couch so he can listen to them yabber. <laughs> but oh, it makes me feel so good. And oh, and he said he gives me a... a, 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 a Suggestion or an idea of, you know, oh, it helped set me. No, it didn't. All psychology will do is trade one bondage for another, for another, for another, until psychology decides that your bondage isn't a bondage. You ever realize that? Used to, psychology said homosexuality was an aberrant and a deviant lifestyle. Oh, but psychology changed its mind now, so we're supposed to change our mind with it. God's word don't change. So that needs to be the standard. I'm talking about the Catholic Church now, too. The Catholic Church has said, oh, well, if we say it's this way, then it's this way. The Catholic Church has said some things in the past is this way, and then they say, oh, but we changed that, and so it's changed. No. If it was wrong then, it's wrong today if it was in the word of God. See, we, that's why we need to go back to the foundation. We need the cornerstone. We need the, the anchor of the word of God in our life because God doesn't change. His word does not change. Why doesn't God change or his word? Because he's perfect. Somebody's getting that. We all need to get that because he's perfect and he don't need to change. He doesn't, he doesn't, like we, we talked about, you know, I was thinking even more, we talked about that plan that we're his workmanship in Christ Jesus and that God has drawn out, he has, he has made the blueprint, if you will, I'm gonna call it, let's make the red print, He's made the red print of our life. You know, he didn't have to, you know, we says he took a pencil. I'm saying he didn't take no pencil. What's a pencil represent? What's on the end of your pencil? What's on the other end? An eraser. God don't be needing no eraser. Well, that's a different kind of thing. But most of the time, on the end of a pencil, you got to carry another eraser with you on a pencil is meant to be erased. Amen. That's what I'm saying. Yes. You see, God's perfect. He's not sitting there in heaven going, hmm. Nah, that's too messy. But with God, he don't need it. Exactly. God don't need no erasure. Right. Neither does a carpenter. That's right. <laughs> yeah. A carpenter cut it. It ain't right. He cuts it again. Yep. But because God is perfect, we are his workmanship. He's drawn out the plan. Like I said here a couple weeks ago, he don't use a pencil. He takes a pen. And the ink that God uses to, 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 to make that red print, as we're going to call it, is the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ. You can rest knowing that the plan that God has for you, he's drawn it out in the blood of Jesus Christ. He hasn't had to scribble a line out or a scribble a line out here or there because his plan is a perfect plan. It doesn't need any help from you or me. It only needs us to trust him, 
put our faith in his plan and follow after him. We can be assured that if God has devised it for us, it's perfect. There ain't a single man in this world could draw a plan for you that he hadn't erased some. Well, God don't erase. He's got a plan. So if she, if she, so then if, while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. When we put our faith in anything other than Christ, we are looked at as spiritual adulterers in the eyes of God. Everybody agree adultery is sin? Yes. Does everybody agree that sin will hinder your relationship with the Lord? See, that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier. The enemy has so blinded the church, blinded us through psychology, blinded us through that name it, claim it, word of faith, bunch of baloney. He has blinded us through the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, the lust of the eyes. He has, he has blinded and misled the church to where we don't realize that those things that we're trusting in, even those good things, Oh, you gotta fast for so many days. Oh, you gotta cover your head with a with a a, 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 a blanket and call it a something or another. And only then will God hear your prayer. Oh, my faith. Oh, God, I'm covering my head. You're putting your faith in that. You're putting your faith in the fact that you're praying sometimes. Oh, God, I've done it. I've been there. I've told y'all before using the example of tithing. We were in a, in, 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 a, in a spot, you know, not knowing where the money was coming from. And, and I've, we've always tithed. And I say, God, I've been tithing. I've been giving. I don't understand. And God had to go pow and say, you're trusting in yourself. You're tithing. I had to repent of that. That was the Holy Spirit showing that to me. I thought I was doing right, not realizing it was misplaced faith. Did I quit tithing then? Not on your life. I just quit trusting in my action of doing so. You see what I'm saying? Even the good thing, the right things. Do you need to tithe? Yes, because you're showing, if, if you're doing it right, you're saying, God, you gave it to me. It's yours. I'm, you're letting me give you some back, and I'm trusting you that you're still taking care of me. You know? With anything else. Yeah. Bible reading, we do the same thing. Going to church, we do the same thing. We get to looking at that stuff thinking, oh, because I've done this, God, you owe me something. That's really what we're thinking. I tithe, so you owe me it. You, know, you, you owe to take care of me, God. <laughs> he don't owe you nothing. Right. I prayed for an hour today, God, so... Uh, I get a reprieve and I can watch this stupid movie. You know, I can listen to this. I, I can drink my beer or whatever it might be. You know, I don't know we think of so many foolish things often. But we put our faith in those things. And God says, he knows your heart. He knows your heart even better than you. Yes, even better than we do. Way better than we think. And you know what? He knows when we're really trusting him. We may not really realize if we're trusting him or not, or that we are. But he realize, He knows when we're really trusting him, and he knows when we're really not trusting him. You see, and when we trust him, he takes care of us. When we, when we trust in other things, we frustrate the grace of God. The grace of God, the effectual working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We frustrate the grace of God in our lives because our faith is misplaced. We're in a condition of spiritual adultery. Living in a way that keeps us at arm's length with God. We got to realize and come back to the understanding that it's faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified alone and faith there alone, not mixed with anything else that God is looking for. And when he sees that, the Holy Spirit goes from this to this, and he can help you. He can come in. And with his help, 
If there's something that's binding you or, or keeping you down, an addiction or whatever it is, he can set you free because what? What did we just learned tonight? You're already free. You're already free in Christ. Is anything binding Jesus, holding him back? If we are in him and we are his body, he is the head, and we're trusting in him, there is nothing that our God can't do in our hearts and our lives to set us free from anything and everything. Put your trust in him. Walk with him. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, like we said, the law is not dead, but we have died in Christ. One or the other has to die. One or the other. And that death, I think we looked at that, or that being dead, as we looked at that last week, it has a change of place or position. That death. We don't cease to be, but we have changed by faith in Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. We change our place and position of being dead in trespasses and sins to being alive to God. We change from having faith in something else, our position of faith in something else, to faith in Christ and what he did for us at Calvary. It's a change of place or position. If her husband be dead, if he's changed to place or position, or if we are dead, we're dead in Christ, we've changed place and position, it says she is free from that law. Do you hear that? We changed place and position in Christ by his death and faith in him. We have died. We changed place and position. And having changed place and position from in Adam to in Christ, as Romans 5 tells us, we are now free. Come on. Free. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. Wasn't that Martin Luther King Jr. guy? I'm free at last in Christ Jesus because of faith in what he did for me at Calvary. We are free. You're free from the law. And being set free from the law, that means that the power of the sin nature has been made of none effect in our lives. And it all goes back to the cross, what Jesus there did. So the power of the sin nature broken, the power of the dominion of law or now. And, and, and we'll stop here when we get, get this. Does that mean we go about being lawbreakers? No. God forbid. There again. We have not been set free from the sin nature so that we can sin. We have not been set free from the law so that we disregard. We don't go around killing, stealing, blaspheming God. You know, speaking of just the Ten Commandments there, they still apply in your life. You know? You're free that you don't have to live under that dominion. You don't have to constantly be trying not to do the do nots. Okay? I don't have to constantly be trying to not to not uh, lust or not steal. When I walk by that candy bar in the in the convenience store, I don't have to say, don't steal it, don't steal it, don't steal it. See, that's what the Catholics did. The Catholics took the whip and beat themselves. Because they were trying to, you know, don't don't do this. I did this, so I gotta get a beating. Pay a take uh, uh, pay a penance. You see, I can walk by that candy bar and I can say, if God wants me to have it, he's going to give me some money to buy that thing. Or he's going to have somebody else buy it for me. Or I don't need it. Or he's already going to put the money in my pocket and I can go buy the thing if I want. I don't want to steal. That's what it is. He, that desire to steal. You see, okay. As a child, who in here never stole anything? Besides Rachel, because I'd have beat her to death if I found that. I'll guarantee you, when I was a little boy, I picked up that bu bu bubble gum out of 7 Eleven. Oh, I got you some candy bar. Yeah, you did worse than me. Whatever it was we did, you know? 
We took our brother or sister's roll of quarters. That doesn't happen to me. You know what I'm saying? Our house. But we all did those things as children. But we are set free. We don't need, we don't want to do those things. I don't want to go run around on my wife. Haven't the Betsy one woman's enough for any man? Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Same way for the women. One man's enough. Ladies, you don't need no other guy. I don't, I don't want to go and steal something. I don't want to go and buy beer and drink it up and get wasted and act a fool. I don't need those things. I got Jesus. I want to please him. You see, that's what happens when the new nature comes in. Our wants, our desires change. Don't tell me you're saved if your desires have not changed. Okay? Oh, I like my drinking. Something's wrong if you're claiming to be a Christian and you say, I like this thing. It's not good for you. I like my drugs. I like my stealing. I like my carousing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -mm. We will hate those things. We will seek. We will cry to the Lord. We will beg and we will plead even when we don't understand. God, I don't want this in my life. Lord, help me with these, these tendencies, these, these desires in my life. There is no such thing as a homosexual, a practicing homosexual that is a Christian. And they're practicing that without remorse. You hear what I'm saying? Now, there are some homosexuals who have been saved that are Christians, that that life, those, 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 those inordinate desires may still have some, some, some ground in their life, but they're saying, no. They're saying, I don't want this any longer. I'm a new creation. I don't need that any longer. They may be struggling for a while until they finally come to that place where, like we said in the beginning here of that inheritance that we have in Christ, till they understand they don't have to wait to receive deliverance. It, it's already theirs. That's part of our inheritance in Christ. You have already been delivered from the drugs. You have been delivered from the alcohol. You don't have to wonder any longer. You don't have to sit there and say, well, when God takes it away, then I'll let it lay it down. Uh-uh. Lay it down because you are free. Hmm. If we're still in bondage, it's because we don't know. What we've been talking about tonight? Knowing what we have in Christ. Why is there as much in the church, men and women alike, addicted to pornography as there is in the world? Because they don't know. They've gone to church, and some church has been one of that seeker sensitive things and said oh well just come on just as you are and if you hang around us long enough aren't we the best thing in your life if you hang around us long enough then those desires will just go away no it's not going to happen that way yeah it probably will because they're not being taught they're not knowing that they're already and see Bringing this back to what we were saying. Taking the gospel to the world around us. Taking it to our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and our nieces and our nephews and whoever they might be. Because we know that we have been set free. We can share with them. Those, the, as, it, as it says, Paul would say in Corinthians, and such were some of you, but you have been washed. You know, the whoremonger, the effeminate, the abusers of themselves would make up, whatever it might be, we can go to them and say, you don't have to remain burdened down by this sin, living a life of condemnation and guilt, because every, I don't care, I don't care what they say on the outside, and how much they try to fake it on the outside, every one of them, whoever they are, lost in sin, in some way or another, deep down, 
there is there is a misery there is a a, a, a uh, an awfulness I don't know how else to explain it but there is a condemnation in their hearts and their lives you see Jesus said I didn't come to condemn the world the world is already condemned we are condemned within ourselves because we ultimately know when we're going wrong that we're out of relationship with God there's a what they, they, they've said in, the, in, in some there's a God-sized hole in the heart of every man, however you want to, something like that. But there is that place, even if it's even so slight, in the hearts of every person that says there is a God, there is something. In the hardness of atheist, he's miserable. Sin makes people miserable. And only as we learn and we walk in what we learn of being set free in Christ, set free from the sin nature, set free from having to live under a regimen of laws and rules to think we're pleasing God or to be something. You know, we, we, we've talked about before, we don't do what we do to be. I don't, we don't, we don't pray, we don't come to church, we don't, you know, read the Bible, whatever it might be. We don't do those things to be in relationship with the Lord to be a believer, those things are, are in our lives and prevalent in our lives because we are in relationship with Him. The, any new couple, they want to learn more and more about each other. You know, sometimes they get to be married a hundred years and it's still there's something more to learn about each other. But sometimes we grow cold in those relationships. Don't grow cold in your relationship with you know what I'm saying? There is always more to know. There is always more to understanding. And what he is done, even when all of this is done and we're in eternity, when we've been in eternity for eternity, 10 billion years, if you want to count years in eternity, I don't know that you can or not, but when we've been there, what does that song say? 10 billion years? 10,000 years, something like that, we've only just begun to learn what it is that Christ has done for us at Calvary. You know, I think I, I shared the other day that, that they were talking about the number of the stars in the heavens. That's just the stars. Stars are suns. They were talking about the number of the stars in heavens. It would take 100,000 earths and the sand. You know, God told Abraham, your, 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 your children, the number of your children shall be as the number of the sand grains on the seashore. Well, they say that the number of the stars in the heavens is so great and so numerous that it would take all the seashores of a hundred thousand earths to of the sand on those seashores to number the stars in that doesn't mean the planets. That means the stars, like the sun. That's just the sun. That's just the For sun. The of those planets. Can you imagine that? And God, get this. He's got a name. Can you imagine that? It ain't like Alpha 1, Alpha 2, Alpha 3, Alpha 4. <laughs> but God has a name for every one of those stars. And he cares about us. Who am I that you're mindful of me? My Lord, that he would save us. We got an awesome God. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. He has set us free. And we didn't get to verse 4. But you know what? We'll get there next week. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord, this evening. I thank you, Lord, that your wonders are never ending. Lord, that your mercy never ends, that your grace never ends. Lord, that it's new every morning. Father, I just thank you for your word, Lord, and what we can learn from your word, Father, what we can see there, what we can know of you. Lord, I'm asking this evening, Father, that you would put a greater hunger, a greater desire in the heart of every person here in this place and every person that may see this later on on YouTube, no matter how many years down the road it might be. 
But Father, as they hear this word going forth, the Lord, that there would be a hunger in their hearts and a desire, Lord, and that they would call, cry out to you, Lord, whether it be for the first time in repentance or the hundredth time in just calling your name, Father. Lord, touch their hearts and their lives and draw them to you, Lord. Draw us closer to you. Lead us, Lord, into a closer walk and relationship with you than we've ever known before, Father. Lord, I thank you for this time you've given us. Lord, I thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. Lord, let it always be upon our hearts and our minds, knowing, Lord, that our faith has to rest there, that our, our faith needs rest there, Lord. And as it does, that we have your promise, your word is a promise, that, Lord, you'll lead us and guide us and teach us, Father, in all that we need. Lord, I thank you for this evening that you've allowed us to come together. Lord, go with us, Father. Be, be, be glorified in our lives, Lord, we ask.